Hello, I'm Professor Ginko, and it's October, so you know what that means. Pumpkin Spice Everything, Soup Season, and Horrific Fates. You may not know this, but animals not sharing our sense of morality have all sorts of creepy ways to eat, reproduce, and in general live their lives. Although you may feel that nature sometimes is very scary, and it kind of is, in general, learning about these different lifestyles gives us a better grasp on the world we live in. So today, we're going to go through the scariest animals, each one representing a monster of some sort. Our look today goes through all sorts of animals, big to small, of vertebrates and invertebrates, and each of them will have a very messed up lifestyle from our point of view. Without further ado, let's go through these five creepy monsters. Siren. The siren is a classic monster, a creature that preyed on men by seducing them with a mysterious song. Similar myths happen all around the world, with them being mainly women who lure unsuspecting men to their graves. These stories stem from the mixed feelings men in heavily patriarchal societies had toward women, find them both alluring and dangerous. This entry in our list, however, this one does have something to fear. This is a hunting ground of the Femme Fatale Lightning Bug, and if you can't find her, well, you're not alone. Femme Fatale Lightning Bug specializes in pretending to be a female of another species. Then, when she's attracted to a male with the promise of tender lovin', she kills and eats him. Nature is all sort of mimicry. The most common being aggressive and defensive mimicry. Defensive mimicry hides you from predators, while aggressive mimicry hides you from prey. Plenty of animals, from tigers to insect larvae, use it pretty well. You can think of it as a disguise to make their prey let down their guard. Femme Fatale Lightning Bug is what's called a Basian Wallachian, or prey mimic. Instead of pretending to be food or a random plant, it disguises itself as its prey. Even from the prey's perspective, you wouldn't know the predator was among your herd, until it was too late. But what makes the Fempatel lightning bug really strange is that it's still a firefly. It's not an animal pretending to be a firefly, it is a firefly. Which means that unlike the other predators, males really wouldn't notice until it's way too late. Our next entry, however, it takes its disguise to another level. It uses aggressive mimicry for a more sinister end. Changeling The changeling is a fairy myth. The tales tell and fairies switching a baby with one of their own. The child's fate is left ambiguous, with the child going to the realm of the fairies. And the changeling myth is one that's resonated with humanity for the generations. The fear that someone close to you isn't exactly what they seem isn't super uncommon, but there's a bird species that is basically a fairy changeling. So, uh, you may not notice it, or you maybe might right now, but one of these animals has been switched by the cuckoo. I'm pretty sure everyone's heard of the cuckoo, or at least know of the name. Now, the cuckoo is what's called a brood parasite. That's an animal that switches one of its young to be raised by a host. Brood parasites are uncommon in most animal groups, but birds are the most common, and the benefit is pretty easy to see. The benefit is very easy to see. Just spending your own time and resources to keep a baby alive, why not have someone else do it for free? The cuckoo will first disguise itself as a hawk. It scares the birds around it, and that gives it a chance to lay its eggs into the nest of others. The murder starts directly when the cuckoo lays its egg the cuckoo kind of lays the egg above the nest, and the eggs of the cuckoo are a lot harder and larger than the eggs in the nest. So usually, when the cuckoo lays the eggs, there's a chance that their egg might actually break its foster siblings right off the gate. On top of that, the cuckoo chick is a small baby filled with a lot of murder. Like, I'm talking a lot of murder. For example, the cuckoo chick instinctively knows it needs a lot of food to survive, so, right from birth, it will try to throw the other eggs, and sometimes even babies, out of the nest. In addition, the cuckoo is perfectly adapted to tossing its nestmates out of the egg, with it being a lot larger and being able to kind of scoop out eggs and other babies with its back. This isn't a one-to-one -one perfect plan, however. Some species have adapted this by having certain markings on their eggs. For the babies having a very specific family call that was imprinted on them when they were still in the egg. However, if the cuckoo baby is killed, sometimes an angry mama replies with incredible violence. Oftentimes, an entire clutch of egg will be demolished, and sometimes birds don't just build a defense and just keep the baby in their nests. Scientists have theorized this as a sort of mafia theory, a sort of you keep my baby alive and I don't kill your family sort of deal. This very dark behavior is what lands a cuckoo at the bottom of our list, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. Body Snatchers Body Snatcher is a sort of campy alien type that has somehow endured for a while. We talked earlier about the fear that the Changeling had throughout the years with the alien abduction and the 
alien infiltrator conspiracy memes are more modern tales, with the same primal fear of someone close to you not being what they seem driving it. However, the act of using someone else's body by controlling their mind isn't so far-fetched. A lot of parasites and bacteria go straight to the brain. This changes the behavior of those, like for example, with the parasitic fungus cordyceps well known to the last of us, the strange reproduction habit of infecting insects and making it die in the best spot to spread spores. However, a few parasites, including, in my opinion, cordyceps, do it better than the bacterium Toxoplasmosa. Toxoplasmosa is a bacteria that spreads first by infecting small prey animals like rats and mice. Once inside, they then start their work by infecting the brain and then lower their anxiety levels and fear of cats, and they even make them attracted to their natural predator. Once they're eventually eaten, they then infect the cats. Though it's not as drastically in the cats, they do spread the feces, then eaten by rats, and the cycle continues. But why two animals? Why not stay in one? Well, the inside of a cat is perfectly suited for the bacteria to reproduce inside. However, it is really unsuited for the development of young bacteria. So instead, they kind of put the young in the feces in the hope that they'll be eaten by a scavenger and then return to the cat in a big old cycle. It's not perfect, however. Humans, for example, can be infected by our own pet cats, and it could also infect unlucky goats, pigs, and really unlucky sea otters, which to them, it can be extremely deadly. So remember, don't flush your litter down the toilet. Toxoplasmosa is a very weird parasite with a bizarre relationship with its hosts. The next one takes the title of house guests to the extreme. Past here is the chicken egg of sort. Numbers one and two are parasites a little more squeakish than the last ones. So if you are squeamish, you have been warned. You okay? Okay. Let's continue on some more creepy ways on how our weird animals live. Vampire. So the vampire is a classic monster and existing in folklore for a long time before being codified in Bram Stoker's 1897 novel, Dracula. The monster lurking in the dark that's here to consume your blood is actually something that kind of exists, as eh, sort of. Hemophagy, or the consumption of blood, is a real life adaptation that a lot of animals have turned to over the years. Blood is very rich in nutrients, and it's a lot easier to get than catching and killing your own prey. But the vampire you're gonna see today, the tongue-eating louse, takes it to an entirely new level. Most blood-sucking parasites have a touch-and-go style feeding. In general, you want your host to survive, and you don't normally have to worry about where the consequences of your actions if you're long gone. The bloodsucker way, usually, is to drink some blood off of some larger animal and leave nothing behind except for the life-threatening diseases. Uh, oops. The tongue-eating louse, however, is not your normal parasite. First, it makes its way to the base of a fish's tongue and severs the blood vessels. After that, it feeds the blood and the mucus until the tongue slowly atrophies, leaving nothing but a strat of husk. After that, the louse takes a permanent residency, and it'll take the role of a tongue. After that, it'll hook at the base of the mouth, and then move the food down to the throat. The only known case of a parasite replacing an organ instead of dying and dashing, which is all the responsible little arthropod, um, but then it was on a standard weird parasite stuff when you realize that now the louse is tied to the fish in a very, very mutualistic relationship. If the louse dies, the fish will 100% starve because it has no tongue. On top of that, should the fish die, the louse will then lose its home and eventually starve. So, uh, like it or not, the two are partners for all eternity after that, which is very, very unusual. Most parasites do not do that. However, this is only our number two slot. The next one is a whole lot more darker. Zombie. The dead rising to attack the living is not one that is uncommon in folklore. The oldest reference of a zombie being in the Sumerian myth, the descent of Ishtar. Ishtar threatens to raise the dead to consume the living. However, modern zombie has its origins from Haitian lore, where a zombie is a reanimated corpse from a witch doctor. Rather than the modern scientific zombie, which normally is from a plague, Haitian zombie is a monster of mystery and magic. However, the archetypical zombie we know today comes from George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead, where it removes the magic of the monster. Instead, the zombie in there works to highlight mankind's flaws in the face of emergency, with survivors sometimes being more deadly than the zombies. In real life, the dead don't come back to life, but there are animals that come close to that. We've seen a good amount of parasites today, 
there are very few that arguably are the king of parasites, one of them being the wasp. Now, the wasp is known for being all kinds of messed up in the reproduction strategy. For example, the fig wasp will lay its eggs inside unripe figs, which then becomes its two mesid fruits. The most well-known wasp reproduction, however, involves something a lot more darker. Parasitic wasps with the suborder Apocrya are pretty good parents as far as bugs are concerned. They want to make their children have fresh, hot food every day. This is uh, unfortunate for the bugs and raccoons around them, because those fresh, hot lunches the larvae survive are in fact them. And in order to ensure maximum freshness, they'll oftentimes resort to parasitism. Specifically, parasitoids. Now, parasitoids blur the line between parasites and predators. The main difference is, in general, a parasite won't usually directly kill its host. A parasitoid, however, always kills its host in the end. Parasitoid wasp larvae, laid on top of the prey, or sometimes the host is paralyzed first, with an egg being inserted inside it. Either way, the infected animal is then eaten alive. If they're lucky, they're dead first. If not, they might find themselves paralyzed, waiting until the egg hatches, and then they could finally die as the animal burrowing under their skin slowly eats their organs. In some cases, the wasp first cuts part of the brain and then leaves their victims alive, like with the emerald cockroach wasp. The emerald cockroach wasp finds roaches, and then after cutting off part of their brain, they'll then lead them around right into a safe place where its babies will grow. However, larvae from the genus Glyptoplantalis will take the zombification to another level. Their larvae are similar enough to other wasp larvae. The mother sets the eggs in the caterpillar, then it grows, and then they hatch out of their host, killing them. You know, standard uh, parasitic wasp stuff. Disgusting, but standard. What makes them really unique is that isn't where their host's poor life ends, unfortunately. Oftentimes, they'll just sit there waiting above the pupa. They won't eat, and they don't usually move from their spot, and they'll only stop to spin silk to protect the pupa. But, when predator comes around, the zombie caterpillar was then suddenly thrashed the predator. They usually leave the caterpillar alone after that. However, this isn't just Stockholm Syndrome. Scientists have discovered that not all the larvae leave the caterpillar. One to two larvae stick around inside their half-eating host, treating it like this big old mecha flesh suit to protect their siblings. Zombification is fairly standard for a paramount parasitic wasp, but these larvae take it to a whole other level, making them, in my opinion, the most creepy monster on their list. No other animal here will then take the half-dead animal that they hunt and then use them to protect their children. Good job, parasitic wasps, making people question their faith in a benevolent god since Darwin. So yeah, some real homicidal jokers in the animal kingdom, but that's just how nature is. Nature really doesn't care about ethics. If it works, it works. If successful, it'll get passed off the next generation, and another little breed of nightmares is formed. Nature sometimes is very beautiful, Sometimes it's very freaky, but I love it so much because it's always wonderful. So I hope you enjoyed the video this time. Happy Halloween. I will see you guys later.